Hi, I'm Stefan Gravenstein. I'm a professor of medicine here at Case Western Reserve University, and we'll be doing a talk on Lost in Transitions, Patient-Centered to Patient-Directed Care. Shankar Nanasekaran, assistant professor here at Case Western again, and we'll be talking about care transitions and what uh, impact it has on our learners and the system as a whole. He served as a regional epidemiologist and pioneered and initiated the development of an acute care for the elderly unit at The Ohio State University, where he served as an assistant professor before joining the faculty here at UH just two months ago. He holds the position of Associate Fellowship Director in Geriatrics and Associate Medical Director at Hannah House and Bedford Regional Hospitals. He has an interest in antibiotic stewardship and long-term care facilities, inflammatory pathways in the development of chronic disease in the elderly, and heart failure. Together, Dr. Nana Sakharin and Gravenstein are working together to develop and disseminate best practices in geriatrics, both at our institution and its affiliates. Please join me in the true pleasure of introducing Drs. Gravenstein and first, Dr. Nana Sakharin. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks for having to hear me. Okay. Um, so, first, when you are learning to react rates, one thing you also get as a compliment is learning difficult names, like mine. <laughs> so, I have a second name on the list there, not the first one. So, thanks for having me here. Okay. So, I put this slide over here because I thought it was funny. So let me read the caption here. Uh, remember the 20 extra years you added to your life to keep healthy living? Well, these are them. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, if we look at it a little bit more now, and we start thinking about it, I started wondering, you know, what's happening with this kind of scenario over here? This, this person, this position over here represents us. You know, it's, it's us as a system here. And what are we doing to our patients? We are trying to give quality care, but how is it shown as an outcome over here? That looks entirely different from what we really want the patients to have. Okay, I'm going to make it a little bit interactive here. So if you guys don't get to answer, then your chief president gets to answer. <laughs> okay, here's the first one. What is philanthropia? I don't want to know anybody to know the answer because it's, it's something I need to answer. Okay, but I take it as everybody knows. But again, it's the ability to stay alert without much sleep. That's good and good. Yeah. If, if there is a pulmonologist in this group, he might be knowing it, or a sleep specialist, he might be knowing it. But that's all it means. I you know, I was just looking for a very difficult word and it came up with this. And, and it's an ability to stay alert. So if you have a patient who says, I'm not able to sleep, that's a disability, that's insomnia. Don't confuse that with this one here. Okay? So this is an ability to stay alert and I want you guys to have the ability until I'm done. And when I'm done, the grand Okay? Alright, here's a question. Top three diseases appropriate for elderly patients. I can give a clue. It's a trick question. Now come on, come on with something. Alzheimer's? What else? I don't care the top of it. What's the name? Paul. Excellent. What else? Stroke. So you got three at least. Very good. Well done. You guys are all thinking in the right direction, but the answer is wrong. So the answer is, for this question specific, I told you it's a trick slide there. I'm asking you what is very appropriate for an older patient to have. There is no disease that's appropriate for an older patient to have. There's no appropriate disease. This is how we think. We think that you know when people get mature, then we think about diseases. That perception could change. There is no appropriate disease for people to have. <laughs> okay, here are some real questions. Let's see if we can answer these. Uh, and again, this talk is going greatly, you know, to understand how the whole care transition system works and what kind of, you know, um, pitfalls we have in our current model and how we would improve them. So these questions are based on those ideas. 
So in the thinking about that, let's try to answer some of these questions here. So uh, it's, it's a screen test, so you don't have the answer, you don't know. So all the patients can recite their medicines at discharge. So you guys think? Pause. Okay. Hospitalized older patients can interpret a simple prescription label. Take two, take two, or two at the time. Pause. Okay. Good. Don't be ready to do this lecture anymore. Caregivers possibly influence patient engagement. Yes, I see a lot of years and uh, there's some pause over there. Maybe. Let me see how that goes. And Dr. Ramsey is going to explain in, in depth about all the cat language issues. Patients, caregivers respond to their own priority list. Okay. Uh, non medical education can improve health literacy and reduce readmissions. Maybe. And depends on what health literacy really means for us and how we could define that goal. Coaching of pillars can be done anyway. Anyone knows what pillars mean at this point? Okay. So one of the uh, objective of this uh, talk is really for you guys to know about pillars and what it means. So we we say this for you. Care transitions can be most improved through better provider provider communication. And that's a no brainer. I think it's a yes over here. Okay. Let's see what else we Okay, here's a story I'm telling you guys. It's a confuser. It's 92. He takes 10 different medicines. He can't remember what to take when, so he takes all the medicines at night time. So how many of us have these kind of patients? We do. I do. We all do. These kind of patients, we see them all the time. And uh, we think that's very common. That's, that's how it is, right? That's how they are it. But that's not true, you know, when it comes to system-wide changes, we need to understand, you know, what is it uh, converting itself into best practices? How does it translate to us? Is that something that we could allow for the patients to happen? How does it translate to best practice for us? Okay, there are some cases. I'm going to go over the cases and you guys can answer. Mrs. Goldform, she's 99, she's discharged from the hospital with a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Her discharge instructions tells her to take uh, furosemide, digoxin, and metoprolol. She was also instructed to restart her home medicines again except for furosemide. We did great on that. On the way home, she took her home medicines, which included toprolol and Lasix, and started taking medications as instructed. She's a very good patient. She returned to the year within 72 hours. What happened? Yeah, the double dosing. Somehow she didn't understand the difference between lasix and furosemide, toprol and metoprolol. So those things happen. So we have to be careful on how we counsel the patients, how we educate the patients on what they really know and what they need to know. And um, how many times have you guys, you can just raise your hand for this, have you guys ever thought, if I have a little bit more information on my discharge instruction, it might have been easier. How many times? I work at Hannah House, so I use my hands up in the air. Okay, at least, you know, we all see that, we all see that sometimes our goal forms are not as good as they are supposed to be. The goal forms for people who don't know about the goal form is just the discharge uh, instruction that goes around with the patient and patient transfers from one place to the other. And there's a huge opportunity for that to improve. And uh, the only thing that's very really golden about it was its color. When it came in, if the color was golden, that's how it got its name. And now it's all transitioned to your chronic records. Anyhow. So, Kirpanani, what he did is he did a study on uh, deficiencies in communication of uh, information transfer between hospital and primary care. And he found so much of discrepancy. He didn't find people having test results on the forms. And he didn't find the hospital code several times. Discharge medications were missing. Test results were not mentioned. Patient counseling, huge loss. 90% of the time people do not get good counseling there. And lack of follow-up plan. So it was not there. So now we start thinking about what kind of opportunities we have here. Okay, here's another case here. Mr. Antero is 93, discharged from the hospital after a solution of an acute exacerbation of CHF. 
He was instructed to call to the symptoms of CHF worsen. Over the next three days, his legs began swelling to gain four pounds. The visiting nurse asked him, why did you not call me? He said, my heart is fine. So, so what's lacking here? Education. Education, counseling, counseling about things to call for, red flags about diseases. That's lagging. People don't understand what they think about it, how to convert it to their voice, you know, how do they look at it when you give them instruction. We do a great job in giving instructions. Please call if you have any problems. But what problems? What is considered a problem for CHF and you know, other kinds of problems too? So that's something we should think about. Okay. Here's another case, this is Toad Cooper. She's 92. She's discharged from the hospital to your care at skill nursing facility. And now you are you are at skill nursing facility. You learn prior to the discharge she had COPD and MI and then she had a hip fracture from falling in the kitchen three weeks ago. Now the nurse calls you after she arrives at 7 p.m. and reports that overall her uh, vitals are stable as you can see there. A little bit more short of breath. You're not able to get in touch with the doctor who discharged her. What do you do now? You are the skilled nursing facility physician, just like me. Send her out, maybe. Send her back to the hospital. I see some noise over there. It may be a choice, but you know, it's still the patient is in a facility where we could still watch them. You know, we can do certain things over there. We have engineers there that could be utilized. So maybe keeping her there, finding out the reason why she is being short of breath before sending her out would prevent this kind of transition from happening. Okay, so trying to find out reasoning is very important. Okay, Mrs. Beers. Breaking me off. 94. <laughs> I think that you have made a service. You are on service and uh, it's 2 a.m. You just completed a, an admission for an EKA and you just went up to your sixth floor and you thought maybe now you take a nap and then the ER calls. She brought a patient from the nursing home and she's altered. And you said, damn it, don't do it too now. Mm -hmm. And you could see in this case, you know, all the vitals are stable, temperature is a little bit on the higher side, uh, uh, the labs are looking all right, and our ER physicians and friends, they gave her a foley, okay, and then they gave her some restraints for education, double A. And then he's also offering a third help for you, saying that I can give them or her some Tylenol before I can send her up. What do you guys think? To be honest here, I don't want any kind of lies here. Uh, you are, you are, you are, you know, you are one of the residents. Okay. So I, see, I hear from seniors that it's not the right thing to do. Yes. So it's really not the right thing to do. So you never want to do that unless you see the patient and see what's going on with the patient and find out the reasons why the is altered. You don't want to do things that might hurt the patient. And have you guys heard about the beer's list? Um, okay. <laughs> a beer's list. It's a list of medicines, I think it's in your handout as well. Uh, it it uh, details all the medicines that's inappropriate for a older patient. And it goes to a variety of things and what it to do. So having a look at it can also help us make some safe transitions for the patient. Okay, so if you think of medicine as a killer, it becomes fit on the list. So be cautious about that. Okay, here's one more case. It's 5 p.m. Friday night. You happen to be the lucky person on call. And uh, exactly at 5 p.m. you get a call from Mrs. Weekender. And she's saying that you know, she just got discharged from the hospital and she's saying that she's feeling a little bit more short of breath now. Um, you you are able to you know, access the electronic medical record and then you find that she has CHF and AFib. And uh, you look at the largely the vital signs from the EMR looks all right. And you see the discharge medicines over there. Glazes, um, losartan, and detoxin. The inpatient doctors are not available. So what do you guys do now? It's 5 p.m. You are on Friday night. What do you guys do? Any thoughts? <coughs> you are at home now. So you can't go and see the patient. 
Okay, so I will take that answer. So uh, we do have a service to our patients who don't qualify for home health. Typically, they qualify for a one-time visit from a visiting nurse who can go in and evaluate the patient and find out what's happening. And that's a one-time and stays to the hospitals. So that's something we can utilize. Okay, for these kind of uh, cases. If at all you think the patient needs to be seen, instead of sending her back to the ER. Okay. Alright, Mrs. Gaw lost. She's age 82. She presents to you as a primary care physician. And now she uh, she got lost. She was not seen in your clinic for a long time now and then she comes back to the Bristol's office and uh, um, she's bringing with her a bunch of medicines, you know, 23 medicines over there. And she's saying that she's extremely short of breath and some chest pressure. It's 430 and it's your son's birthday and this is your last patient. <laughs> How many from here on? <laughs> okay, everybody is you know, loving their sons over there. At least three of them are honest. So that's good. So that's again a trick question. Probably she might need to be seen in this case. Okay. Now, the reason for me to do this case over there is not for the, the purpose. The purpose is how, how do you explain when you have a patient and you don't have any information at hand? to know what's happening. This patient just got transferred and discharged from the hospital and we don't have any discharge sunlight with us. So that makes us feel like we are lost, right? And that makes the importance of getting a discharge somebody done for all of our learners as soon as possible. And that's important, you know, we can do it in different ways. We can do it on the same day and clear it along with the patient. And the patient can take it to the primary care and be able to that. Make it much easier. If you're, uh, if you're worried about getting lost or something, that might make the patient more accountable for her own care. And that's a huge thing that we're going to talk about is how do patients take care of themselves rather than we dictating everything, how do we make the patients uh, take the lead over here? Okay, and that's what this slide is saying. It's a lot of the time, at least one third of the time, we don't have to discharge something. And then the hospital primary care communication is also not documented a lot of times. It makes it more and more challenging to take care of chronic complex conditions. Uh, okay, this is the last case, and uh, this is a real member. 86, hypertension, COPD, CKD, congestive heart failure, uh, dementia and depression. Uh, he's admitted to the hospital. Uh, he's a, a, a frequent flyer, as you could see. His home medicines are aspirin, anavagal, some oxygen, furosemide, um, condiment, and uh, sulfuric now he comes back to you. Now the team now decides that he is under treatment and that puts him on metoprolol, aldactone, IN three times a day and three more inhalers. He comes back within a week again. What happened? We did the right thing. We followed the protocol for CHF. We got him on all the right medicines. We sent him out. But he comes back again. So what happened in this case? So what we forgot in this case is the two Ds and the poor compliance. He is already having some cognitive disorders already and he's already not taking the medicine that we gave him. If you put him on five more medicines, he's not going to take it at all. That's what happens. You need to find out what is the right thing to do for the patient. You have to individualize your care. You can't follow standard protocols sometimes, especially when it comes to an elderly patient who has multiple medical problems. You have to deal with individualize your care and find out the right things. You know, for this case, I would not have if I had to do something, I might not have all these things, you know. I might tell educate him more on what he's supposed to do. Maybe if I had to add an iron, I would do it once a day rather than three times a day. He will get extremely constipated with three times a day here. And three in here, it's not going really to take them. So. Okay. Uh, so we should know what our patients really know. Do they really know what they are talking about and what we are talking about? Uh, that's a very important thing that they should know. And we should know too. And the study over here that was done shows that at least 40% of the time the patients don't know the answer for this question. And that's a huge number. So we should first know what the patients really know. We should start talking the patient's voice rather than, you know, uh, are we learning um, they learn our language, it's important that we learn their language. Okay, here's a video. Well, sometimes. 
problems, doctors make mistakes, and you need to try twice as hard to fix them. You use your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using your inhaler? Do I look like an idiot? Good answer. No. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? <laughs> so, you understand what I mean? So, you should really know how to raise this note before we just assume things here. So, why care transitions? Why is it, oh, sorry. Why is it that important? Because of all these issues that we talked about in the case of the image, this is very important. These are common occurrences, and as per the, uh, the studies over here, it says at least 40% uh, of people have two transitions in 30 day time period. Um, between different facilities. And uh, that, that's a huge opportunity to improve, and that goes up until the end of the be very cautious with those other points. Okay. So the transitions can happen between primary care and the patient. Um, so you, as a primary care physician, have to find out reasons where you can improve, uh, improve uh, care coordination over there. You know, maybe you might want to talk with the patient and know that they know their medicines. Maybe you can tell them to start having a, 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 a health record, a personal health record that they could maintain. And I think we have some more slides that talk in more details about that. Uh, if it's between an ED, hospital, and a primary care, same thing runs over here as well. You know, find out places where you could improve. Maybe if the ED calls you as a primary care physician, you might want to give them, want to give them information on the patient so that they know about the patient, they start treating the patient the right way. And then also you can also send the information later um, you know, you can fax them or however it is possible, but appropriate time, you know, making sure that it reaches them on a timely fashion is important. Same thing on the other side as well. As a hospital person or a person who is working in the hospital, you might want to make sure that you get all the information back to the primary care physician so that he knows what has happened in the hospital and how to take care of the patient. So that's very important. So we all play this role with the patient being in the center. So we have to you know, have a good kind of transitions between each kind of facilities over here, having the patient as a background. And for the patient to improve, we sometimes want to think about how do we make the patient a partner in this. And making him as a partner is making him vulnerable for things that he should start thinking about his own time. And the way you do it is what we're going to talk about more today. And uh, it's, it's like having a puzzle here, you know, you, you all are doing whatever you're supposed to do. Uh, in different ways, but unless unless you have a patient involved, you are not going to solve the puzzle there. So, thank you very much, and I'll let Dr. Brown stand here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the objectives of our overall talk is, is to talk about care transitions and moving this from uh, just uh, trying to do a better discharge summary to things that actually make a difference in patient outcomes. And you should know that care transitions is, is more than just communication between providers. Uh, care transitions is uh, how we communicate with our patients too. And uh, this is uh, some of the highlights from uh, Dr. Manasekran's uh, talk. So. Um, to really do this well, we have to do more than just a better practice. We have to change the culture of how we do our care. If we look at uh, risk of readmission, the green color here is the lowest risk. And you can see a good chunk of the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain states have a very low transition rates. Less than one per 1,000 Medicare fee-for-service patients in the world. And when you see the orange, you're up to 23 to 50 or even more than 50 uh, out, of, out of a thousand readmissions. If you wanted to talk about that as individual patients, we're talking about here at University Hospitals, 19.2% of our discharges come back within 30 days. So this is like here at the top, and you can see Cleveland, and we're in the bright red here. So we have lots to do just in our neighborhood. The three most common causes for readmissions are people who come in with diagnoses, not necessarily the first diagnosis, but one of the top three. A heart failure, pneumonia, and AMI. And if I had to put one more in there, I'd add diabetes. That's an often uh, coincident thing. And that shouldn't surprise you that, uh, especially heart failure and diabetes, those are folks that often are already getting uh, 10 or more medications just for those conditions. We also know that 
through a variety of uh, uh, randomized controlled trials, that we can reduce this readmission risk by a third. If we're presently at 19, uh, we could get it down to 12 right here in this hospital, and we could do it within a few months just by doing what the, the things that I'm going to be talking about next. Um, the part that I want to talk about, there's two ways to do this. One is high touch care. This would be the, what we would call the Mary Naylor model. And the Mary Naylor model is a model where you have a nurse practitioner who physically goes in the home and visits with the patients and then does a series of visits as house calls or back into the primary care uh, uh, office setting, which might be a primary care medical home or not, patient-centered medical home or not. The other way to do this is by educating patients better. There's two parts to this how you educate patients and how we do our system of care. And um, when you just do better patient education, you can also reduce this by a third. So you can do it by having high touch care with a nurse practitioner, or you can do it as a low touch care where you just do a little bit more education. That takes about an hour to do. So uh, what we did is, is we convened a group of people. This is uh, work we did in Rhode Island. And we asked primary care doctors, hospitalists, uh, uh, home, uh, health agencies, emergency room doctors, SNFs, uh, uh, skilled nursing facility doctors, um, and primary care docs all to get together and say, so tell me what's wrong, how we can improve transitions, and how should it look if you had an ideal world? And the ideal world that they came up with, this is the, the phrase, the healthcare system where discharged patients and their caregivers understand their conditions and medications, know who to contact with questions and when and are supported by healthcare professionals who have access to the right information at the right time. Now the back half of this, access to healthcare professionals, um, uh, supported by healthcare professionals who have access to the right information at the right time, that's ultimately what we talk about with one chart, right? That's part of how we get there. And the UH system will be there in the next year or so. The front half is how we educate our patients. So the healthcare system where discharge patients and their caregivers understand their conditions and medications know who to contact with questions and when. So think about this. When your patients leave, do they know this? So this is the heart of the Coleman model care transitions intervention. The four things we want patients to know is their conditions and medications, know who to contact with questions and when, and it takes us about an hour to teach them this. So um, the, in Coleman's model, there's a coach, a person, in his case, he was using nurses, in our case, when we did this at Rhode Island across six hospitals, uh, we could do it also with high school graduates. So they didn't actually have to have health education. Um, and they do a visit in the hospital where they say, hey, do you mind if I do a home visit to talk with you about stuff that will keep you safe at home? They do a home visit, which takes anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. The load for that is just under an hour. And then they do a, tel a telephone follow-up call within 30 days, but they leave their number where the patients can call back in. And uh, the four things they teach, they have them write this in a personal health record, their conditions, their medications, essentially the patient's learning how to do their own med rec. So when they get that discharge set of medications and they have to reconcile with their home medication, that mistake that you saw in case one doesn't, doesn't occur. And then how to make a follow-up appointment and keep it within seven days. And if they get a warning sign that some symptom is, is worsening, that they know what the warning signs are, and how they get through the triage question when the receptionist in the primary care office says, well, we have an opening in three months, how about then? That they can, in fact, get through that barrier and figure out how to get over the book perhaps in the next day. So how do they do that? And do they, should they actually have to fight that? So when we did this study in Rhode Island, we had uh, 24,000 people who were eligible to be in the study. They had to be in the hospital on a med surge service. Uh, 2,000 of them, every chance we got, we came face to face with somebody and said, can we do this with you? Of that, about half said, sure, you can do a home visit, you can teach me this stuff. And of the half that said, sure, two-thirds, ultimately, we either couldn't find, even though they gave us three telephone numbers, or they said, no thanks, after the fact. The other uh, third said, sure, come on in, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do this. Now, you notice we had an intervention group, those of people who actually got the home visit, an internal control group, those of course we came face to face with, and said, no thanks, either up front or after the fact, or we couldn't get through to And then an external control group that was matched to these other two groups. And we, we were afraid that the only people who said yes were the ones that would do well anyhow, right? That we were cherry picking. So if we did this well, then the internal control group should perform no worse than the external control group. If we were cherry picking, the internal control group would be much worse. So this is what we found. Essentially, the internal and external control groups had roughly the same readmission rates. 
and our individual growth is down to 13%. Uh, so we got roughly a 35 to 40% reduction in readmissions applying the Coleman model, spending this uh, uh, roughly hours worth of talking to the patient. Now, having said that, um, we have a huge problem here. Even though we can say that we replicated uh, Coleman's results, we only had a quarter of those people who said, uh, bring it on, actually allow us into their home. That means three quarters of patients have missed this opportunity to potentially be better. And so one of our notions is, is maybe we need to do this uh, before they leave the hospital while we still have them in our clutches and teach them a slightly different way. So in Rhode Island, we started at 15%. Um, actually, we were, we were at, uh, just over 30% when we started our project back in 2008. And you can see just between 2009 to 2013 now, we've continued to come down, and we're now down to 12%, and ongoing down. Compared to here at, uh, at uh, uh, Case Medical Center and the nine system hospitals, we're still operating at 19.2%. <coughs> so, uh, the care transitions intervention is an educational program that takes about an hour to, to, to teach. It involves no medical intervention, so there's, uh, there's nobody adjusting medications. It focuses on the patient empowerment that where the patients are forced to write down what they know as they understand it. And in our hands, anybody can teach this. We can teach high school graduates uh, because we're teaching them the stuff that any lay person should already know how to do. It's self-confidence increases because they know that it's okay to ask, it's okay not to know stuff. Uh, we, uh, a paper that we have now in review says that this is sustainable. So when we teach this six months out, the people who get the intervention are still have reduced utilization. The average cost avoidance is $526 a month, every month planning for the patients we do this house call for. So this is $3,000 bucks in six months, and we're, uh, the, soon we'll have the uh, one-year data, and it looks like it actually sustains out for a full year. So we're teaching them how to fish rather than giving them fish. We're teaching them important skills that probably should have gone even before they were hospitalized in the first place. So uh, we think it's scalable, and we think it's simple enough, and it's highly effective, and it's something all of you can learn how to do. So the other half of this is the system. Can the system support that uh, our providers have access to the right information at the right time? So you can think about uh, what do you know, and do you know it's actually what levels they should be on? Do you know what the truth is for the patient? And how do we tell that? When you call the pharmacy, is that actually what they're taking, or is that just what the pharmacy is dispensing? Uh, when the patient comes in, do they have any idea that they're going to take it? Can they interpret the medication as you prescribe it when they left? How do you know? So, um, so this disconnect between labs that are pending and completed and problem list is part of it. You know, it's part of the elephant. The other way to think about it is places. You know, wherever it is they happen to get their care, does, do the other places have any idea uh, what each other are doing? And when do we uh, subscribe, prescribe? things two or three times or recommend things. And you don't even know that they, for example, went to the emergency room if they're a primary care doc. Or if you're in the hospital, you don't know which their primary care doc is because the patient can't tell you who it is. It's whatever doc they saw last might be their PCP. Could be a dermatologist. So uh, when we gather our stakeholders together, we brought them the evidence base of what seems to work. We ask them, well, if you could imagine how this would work the best, what would you prefer? What would be your, our local preference? And then can you endorse this? And when we did this, we didn't actually just have the providers in. Um, we had others in too, but the process was actually quite interesting because when we started the process, everybody said, it's the hospital's fault if it was somebody outside of the hospital. And the hospital point is the primary care doc's fault because they want more information or they want less information. They complain about too many faxes. They complain about not enough information. So everybody was pointing uh, fingers at each other. And they got essentially put us in this position. Stop pointing fingers and recognize 
that we are the problem. And um, in our case, we brought the insurers into the room and the uh, Department of Health, and, and what we did is we essentially started writing regulations around what the best practices were. Because we wanted the insurers to pay for the stuff we weren't already doing as part of our standard of care. And that's a challenge for us here in Ohio. Um, in your handout, you have a copy of this and the following slide. And this slide is specific to hospital-based best practices. So there's nine best practices here that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, no private uh, primary care physician that a patient's in for an observational hospital stay. They, they often don't know, and if we don't physically call them, uh, they may never find out until the patient shows up someday. Uh, it also prepares them if you want to be extra smart. What you do is, is when you make that call and say, our patient is expected to stay in the hospital for three or four days, how about we make an appointment for him now in 10 days for a follow-up? So you have the appointment scheduled with that first contact, and you get the slot in before it's filled, so it's not taking up extra time. And you do this as part of your intake process at admission. Now, if you do that, you, go, you have to negotiate with the patient because uh, the, the patients often, uh, if you just do it blindly, well, they don't own that appointment. So instead, what you want to do is, is you want to know when their driver is available and you want their driver to commit this to this too if they're not driving themselves. So you have to do this in partnership with the patient. You can't just blindly go make appointments because the primary care doctor will, will, will um, be angry with you because they'll have no shows. When we did this without the patient involvement, our no-show rate was 80%. With patient involvement, our no-show rate was about 20%. Okay? So this is an important piece of this. And if you do it at the time they appear uh, at admission, you have that appointment locked in. You can always cancel it. It's just one of your to-do lists at the back end. You have to shift the appointment because they're in for eight days rather than three days like you expected. So be aware that this is now a workflow process for you. Provide receiving clinicians with hospital clinicians contact information at discharge. So whoever discharges him, the primary care doctor should have a number where they could call back and talk to somebody who knew the patient and knew what was going on. And that number should be a real number and it should work. They should actually be able to get somebody. And then we should be accountable for that patient. In Utah, at the University of Utah, the hospitalists remain the primary contact for the patient until they have made their first follow-up visit. So that's well after discharge. So uh, philosophically, this is who owns the patient? Is it when they leave the glass doors of the building? Are they really the primary care doctor patient when they have no idea what just happened? Or do we own that as when, when they're in the hospital? So in Utah, they have actually changed this. And their current per thousand patient readmission rate is at 6%. Okay? So they have a third of what we have here. Um, provide the patient with written discharge instructions by the We actually do that. But uh, have you looked at those discharge instructions we send? Yeah, could you interpret those? If you can't interpret a prescription, take two at bedtime. Do you have any idea whether patients can understand those discharge instructions? You know, in the ER, they get like eight pages of stuff on their heart failure and so forth. In one of the hospitals we work with in Rhode Island, they shrunk their heart failure education down to a single page, and they got a 50% reduction in their heart failure readmissions within two months. And they had one page, and it was a large, uh, 24-point font, so really big, and it was really simple, and I tell them number to call if they had questions. Just doing that one thing. Um, provide patients with a follow-up number prior to discharge. Perform medication reconciliation prior to discharge. Now, we all do this. Um, I can tell you also being somebody who receives people on whole form at the Hannah House side, I can tell you it is a rare whole form that is completed accurately. Um, you may think when you discharge patients to Hannah House that they're difficult to get them in there, but we're the ones that complain about information being wrong or, or uh, incomplete. All the other SNFs don't complain. And guess what? They have much higher bounce back rates than Hannah House, even though we get the sickest patients. Um, schedule location, outpatient follow-up appointment prior to discharge. I suggest you do this at the beginning. And then provide the primary care officer with a discharge summary. I suggest that your discharge summary should be completed on the day of discharge. And uh, again, in Rhode Island, we now have as a a uh, new Department of Health regulation that all discharge summaries are finished within seven days. And the insurance companies are providing bonus for those that have it done at the time of discharge. And then the last one, invite the primary care physician into the life discussions during the hospital visit. So this, this last piece was something that astonished us because we didn't think that any primary care doctor would actually want to pick up their bags and come into the hospital for these. And in fact, when we started doing it, they typically didn't come. 
but they knew that this was part of the responsibilities because they knew the patients best. And, and the idea is, again, if you start paying for it, then there's going to be ways that they're going to figure out how to fit it into their schedule. Okay, so this is the other slide that's in your hand. And what you're supposed to see here is there was a hospital side which is a reciprocal action for the primary care side. So if a hospital sends you information about a patient, but it's not you're not their primary care provider, how would the hospital know that you work? Because often in the hospital, there's no way for them to actually know who the real primary care provider is. So a reciprocal action about sending this information is that the, the person who's receiving it should say, I'm not the primary care doctor, and that's not them, rather than just shredding the information. So that there's accountability in the way that hospitals can then learn how to improve its practices. And you can read through it here, but in your, uh, you know, confirm receipt of hospital discharge information, make sure that the loop is closed, and then follow up with high-risk patients. But how are they supposed to know who high-risk patients are if they didn't know they were in the hospital, and so forth? So the hospital currently does a call within 48 hours of every discharge here at Case Medical Center. Um, but the primary care office should actually be picking up the ball and making those calls too. Okay, so this was one of those annals of internal medicine cartoons where we feel like happy. I'm sending my detective to find an hospital just for some. So why don't patients already know the pillars, the four colon pillars, the four things? Their main conditions, their medications, how and for what to take them, the warning signs, the red flags, the prompt for help, or how to translate a red flag into a timely appointment. How come we didn't know that they didn't know? If you've been sending patients home and you didn't know that they couldn't interpret take two at bedtime, no, isn't that kind of unconscionable? Can we really let them go and not be confident that they know how to do what we've asked them to do? So, so that's a challenge for you is to say, well, how would you know that? And how can you do this without making lots of extra work in the process? And how did we get to that spot in the first place? The closure of care, it's the pace of our visit. We are paid for volume, not quality. And the fee for service says, you know, if you can do the discharge in six minutes, you're going to make more money than it takes you 10, or it takes you an hour. And the, in the phone tree, when they call the doctor's office, it says something to the effect of, call 911 if this is an emergency, emergency, which means if you really want a doctor, go to the emergency room. Otherwise, we can see you in a couple of months. So the, the legal eagles have told us to be careful about how we say this. And I would propose that we have to change this. I think it's okay to say call 911 if it's an emergency. But you could then say, if you think this can be taken care of in the next day or so, we can make room for an appointment, just call back or leave a message. So you can do a little bit more that makes it feel less like, a, like a blowing them off to the emergency room to get real back care. And then the last of these is how do we tell what patients know? And our current gold standard is we call it teach back. Teach back is you talk to the patient and you say, you understand. And then if you do it a little bit better, you say, okay, tell me what this means, how you would do what I just asked you to do. That would be the higher quality of each bank. But um, was there any other a time in school other than at Grand Rounds where all you had to do was nod to say you knew stuff? We always took notes, right? That's how we learned. We do it through multimedia and other kinds of things. So writing it back, having patients write stuff down in their own hand, not us writing it for them, not giving them a, a final discharge summary, but having them write their own discharge instructions as, as they understand it, would give us a way to know actually what they know. It gives us a way to verify what they know. So, um, training in this from the Pacoma model, what's in the syringe, was, was to teach patients or their caregivers, so if they're demented, you have to use the caregivers for this. And that means you have to know if they're demented. So, uh, for us, for geriatricians, the standard of care would be know if your patient's demented. What's the chance that they're demented if they're over the age of 65? Anybody know? It's about 1 in 10. How about if they're 85? It's a 50%. Yeah, 50% if they're in the room, it'll be 50 to 80%. But if they're ambulatory, otherwise all that really is about one in three. So it's, it's pretty frequent. And how often in your 85 year olds have you actually done cognitive testing, like a mini mental or a logo or a slums or something like that? And then the answer is if, if you typically aren't doing it, how the heck are you supposed to know if they can understand their instructions? Okay? So, um, they complete the personal health records, so they're writing this in their own personal health record. They're writing it in their own hand, and they recognize when they're confused about something, because they'll figure it out as they're writing it down. Well, I don't actually know what this is for. I don't exactly know how I'm supposed to take it. They say at bedtime, but I take a nap at 2 in the afternoon. Is that what they need? You know, stuff like that. So, by recognizing that uh, their own confusion, that they're confused about it, it's okay to ask them about it, is part of this cultural thing where they get to start learning what's happening to them. So um, in the DHRs we did, you can see the one here on the left, and 
You may not be able to read this, but it says things like GERD and HTN and CAD, status post MI, and DM2 and status post uh, CCY. Clearly, this was not written by a patient. It's a nice problem list, okay? I'll give it credit for that, but that is not, uh, not a patient written problem list. This is a little bit better, and you can see here things like uh, nerve changes to legs, uh, neuropathy misspelled, uh, uh, colon polyps, uh, I have no idea what that is, Cooper tunnel, Tedris, okay. So that's a little bit more about the patient, and it gives us an idea about what the patient knows. Now even better than that is when they're filling out the applications, here you can see stomach and heart with signs and sinews and things like this, so read them. You actually understand their understanding of what symptoms or whatever is being treated here. And it's a place to pull out the warning signs to say, well, no, this isn't working. Somehow your medicine isn't working. And that's the reason you should be calling somebody. And maybe you need to get seen the next day, but call somebody and they'll help you figure out whether it needs to be tomorrow or if you want. And the idea here is this. In the, in the days of war, when I trained, it was provider-centered care. It was all about our schedule, and, and patients always got to wait for three hours in the clinic and so forth, because our schedule is the most important one. Um, now we, we're currently at what we call patient-centered care. That's where we are getting so smart about what patients need. We can really tailor it to individual patients. But this is still one step removed from the future we have in mind, which is patient-directed care. That's patients who are actually smart enough to know how to ask for help, and when to ask for help, and, and sort of help through the prevention questions and the red flag questions. So they get the care at the time they need the care, and not a minute later. So how do you do this without making it more work? Uh, this is the write back method in the PHR, the personal health record, where they have to write things down. And so, as a provider, what we would do to start culturally making the patients think about this in a new way is uh, when they check in, for example, at the office, the receptionist says, Did you bring a personal health record? And this is a standard question every time the patient shows up. And if the answer is no, well, here's a new one. We're going to have to start filling this out. The doctor's going to ask you about it. And um, you might want to start with your medication. Just write your medications in there. And if you have time for the other things while you're waiting, you can continue with the other things. You know, next time you come, we're going to ask you about it again. You'll have to start over if you don't bring it. And then when they check in with the uh, medical assistant, uh, they say, here's your blood pressure. You might want to write this in your PHR. Uh, when they get weight, you might want to write that in there. So by the time they get to the physician or the MP or whoever, that they already have the things written down. And the mistakes they make are the places where you know you have to teach. You don't have to teach them what they already know how to do correctly. So it can actually make you more efficient because the patient's doing their homework on the outside with their caregiver. And you, get to, you have filtered information that says, this is what they don't get, this is where you spend your time. And the other thing is, so in the hospital, they could be writing their stuff. And this might be the caregiver writing, because the patient may not be able to get out of bed, on the whiteboard. And what if that patient who had the swollen legs and didn't recognize it was CHF, but if swollen legs was up on that whiteboard, it would tell you as you move for rounds, so instead of saying, here, I'm, uh, I'm your doc, I'm here to see you about your CHF, you would instead say, hey, I'm your doc, I'm here to see you about your swollen legs. We might call that congestive heart failure, but for you, it's swollen legs. And the idea is, is that we ourselves are becoming labor instead of expecting patients to become health labor. We put our language in the words they would use at their dining room table when they're talking to family members instead of trying to make them go to the medical school or nursing school. So, um, value the patient's voice. Use the patient's vocabulary. And uh, by having them write this stuff down, you start learning what it is that they do. So, a way, a process way, and this, you'll see this starting to get piloted in some of the words here, um, uh, is that we're going to start asking nurses when they do a med pass to take out one bill out of the med pass and say, do you know what this is? And if they know it, do you know what it's for? That could be a diagnosis, it could be a symptom. And that if the answer is to either of is no, you should be writing this in your PHR. So that every med pass, as an always event, the patient starts understanding that they're expected to know stuff that they're going on. They're not just in a hotel with bad food and lots of tests. Okay? This is a place where they're supposed to be getting health education that they can manage independently when they leave. And if they can't do it because they're too, too demented, you should have identified who the key learners are going to be who's going to take on that responsibility and invite them in for this education. So um, it's a step toward doing this. At, so in, at the, in the uh, MediCard, the nurse should have a clean PHR and then start handing these out and those should start sh uh, showing up. When this begins, this will we'll start off with one uh, unit of learner tower um, and one unit over the lakeside. 
uh, you'll see a colored pamphlet that will be, give you a clue that it's happening, and I expect that will be happening in about four or five weeks uh, to, to show how that is. So when you see it, look at it, and uh, think about asking them about what's in their PHR if they haven't written anything, encourage them to do so. And if they can't, you should be asking about, well, who's the caregiver that should be helping you with your medications and have them do it. Now, if they're long-term care bound, not just skilled care, that might be a different question and, and a different answer. Okay, so this is the process. After they complete their PHR through their stay, by the time they're done, their personal health record, even though there's med medication changes that might be happening every day, is a patient's idea of what they're supposed to be doing when they get home. Those last changes they make makes their PHR an after-hospital care plan. So if it's a patient that made an after-hospital care plan, and in that last step, we look at our discharge plan and compare it with their after-hospital care plan, try to align them and see where they don't align. And then recognize that if they don't align, it might be because the patient can't do it, they might not have the resources, and we might have to adjust our discharge plan in recognizing that. So it's about the patient directing the care as opposed to us commanding the care, which they may not follow. So you, you do ask the patient about the medications and the medical problems and about the warning signs that if they move, and you test them, such as through write back in the PHR. You don't write in the PHR, you don't correct the PHR. If they make a mistake, you don't fix it. It's their job to fix it. They own this. Let the patient leave the hospital without their per personal record and use medical lingo without linking it to the patient lingo, the patient's words. So, during rounds, ask the patient to show the PHR. See if the patient can use the personal health record any one, every encounter. You can do this as an always event for your encounters. And you don't have to go through the whole personal health record. Just pick one thing that you, uh, that you want to pick on that you think is important for them to know and make sure that that arrives in the personal health record in their words. And by the time they're done, by the time they're discharged, they should have their main problems and medication names, what they're for, main side effects, important signs or symptoms, their warning signs, and who and where to call for help. And you encourage them to use this and take it to their follow-up visits. So, open questions, you learn that in medical school. You focus on the misunderstandings. Always use the patient's or caregiver's words rather than our own words. Encourage the DHR to place, place for notes to ask the doctor. And ask the patient to use an available caregiver or friend for help as needed. So you want to have a buddy system for them for those that are trying to impairment. So, they can learn this. We can teach it. We've done it. We've now done it in a few settings. We've done it in an open healthcare system. Uh, and we need to evolve our culture to embrace these empowered. Um, otherwise, we would, we would have called them difficult patients, right? When the caregiver comes in and asks too many questions. Those difficult patients are the ones that we can actually teach to do the best. So, true false. Older patients can recite their medications of discharge. So, you saw 41% of Medicare fee-for-service patients fail to be able to do this when they're in the hospital. We asked the question, is that because they're old? So we took it to the Women's Infants Hospital next door and asked this of women who were in there from maternity stuff, and they scored 45% that didn't, couldn't figure out what that meant. So this is not about age. It's not about age. You can tell whether or not those patients can interpret a simple prescription label like take to the bedtime with teach back. Not a chance. Okay? Um, caregivers can have a lot of stake with a good discharge. Absolutely. You know, because often the caregivers are the ones that are going to be bringing them back for those appointments and they don't actually want to take that trip. So doing it right the first time is, is better. And, um, and they have something at stake for getting the discharge information right. Now, if, if you do all that caregiver education at the moment of discharge, they'll be right here uh, in the headlights kind of the world. It's too, it's too much information. So you got to start teaching those caregivers when the patient arrives rather than waiting until the last day. And recognize that people who are showing up in the hospital may not be the perfect people who do the caregiving when the patient gets home. It's usually people who fly in from out of town that do the hospital visits, and the one that's been doing the caregiving at home stays home. So you have to make sure you have the right learner in the room so that this gets handled out properly. Providers need to become more like literate. Okay, that's true, that's what I was talking about. Non-medical education can improve health literacy and reduce readmission risk. Yes, that was the Coleman model. We're not teaching them any medical medicine. Uh, we have a social case for an online versus eventual care, and that is, that's true. Uh, we think coaching can be done anywhere, including in the hospital or the primary care office, and that's the self for study now. Uh, coaching any style is effective. This means could it be a nurse, could it be a volunteer? Family medicine is now going to be on the volunteers, and pharmacy students on the family medicine group. And it seems like we're actually able to impact the admission risk on that sort of thing. And then finally, standard care can incorporate the tennis coaching. 
Um, I think so, and I showed you how we could use all these events to make that happen. So the last thought, every nurse's unit, pharmacy, clinic, nursing home, hospital, hospital system has pockets of excellence, and that's where we want to start it, and that's in fact the units that we're going to be using first year. We need to be measured with being done sort of on a formal study list to measure the initial rates on those units. Uh, if it's a unit that you're on, you'll be uh, coached by us on how this is done and how you can participate. And uh, we can learn from each other, and this is a video to make that point. Excuse me, good morning. Do you know what time it is? It's 10 past 10. Are you sure? Just like I said. Thanks. This is where he gets to learn from the other guy how he tells time. Hey, you great day today. No. Yeah. What time is it? I'm nervous. What again? 715. Oh, this is the So, <laughs> and uh, oh, a big team has worked on this work with us in Rhode Island, and we're assembling a big team here to do the same work. Thank you very much.